Jesus is foretold about the, the, the destruction of the temple. And the apostles are understanding who Jesus is finally after all this time. You know, they're like, this is the Son of God. So they start asking him questions. And I can't blame them. I'd ask questions too. I mean, I'd be like, hey, you know, uh, let's win the Super Bowl next year. You know, something. But they're asking when the world is going to end. When 
the day of the Lord. Now, day of the Lord in, in the Jewish faith is huge because day of the Lord is not just the day that means that Christ comes back to the earth. Day of the Lord actually is a day of judgment, a day of jubilation, a day of joy, and a day of sorrow for some people because they're being judged. So this is, this is what the Jewish faith is ramping up to, and in actuality, Christianity is ramping up to it as well. And in, this, uh, in these verses, starting with verse 36, it says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as we were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken away and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that it, but if the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. These people that, that throw these predictions out there, they're false prophets. They have no idea. Now, we'd be naive to believe that Jesus Christ sitting on the right hand of the Father does not know right now. But we also have to remember that Jesus had absolved himself of all that knowledge when he came to earth so that he could suffer as man. So when the disciples asked him this question, he was truthful when he said the only person that knows when this day is coming is the Father. Now, throughout Scripture, we're given signs to be looking for. But these signs have been happening since Christ's death. Actually, since before Christ's death. I mean, we could look at the wars happening in the Middle East. We could look at uh, the, the unrest, the civil unrest that's happening in the United States today. Um, we could look at the eclipse. We could look at a, a number of different things. But it's not all come together until God says it's the right time. So what do we do in the meantime? Do we sit here in fear? Do we, are we scared? Are we, what, what are we? I mean, we've, I've even heard a report on, uh, on one of the news channels, I'm not gonna say which one it was, that there was someone inside of the government pushing war with Korea and with other nuclear nations to try to speed up the apocalypse. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret once again. Man does not control when that happens. That's God and God alone. We have nothing to do with it. Now in that time, what are we to do? Well, let's look at what we've been commanded to do. We've been commanded to go out and to make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is more than just a believer. A lot of times we get that person to say the prayer of salvation and that's what we hang our hat on. We're like, okay, now he's a believer. We can move on to the next one. Well, no, not true at all. Not true at all. We have to teach them how to be Christians. Those of us that are mature in our faith, and we continue to mature, there is no stopping point for that. It is our job to make disciples. Or else Christ wouldn't have said, make disciples. He would have said, go out into the world and make believers. The Holy Spirit makes the believer. And the Holy Spirit will lead that person to a church. And the Holy Spirit will lead that person to do certain things in their life. But discipleship is the responsibility of the church. I'm not saying that you can't learn discipleship outside of the church. But where do you learn to interpret scripture? Where do you learn to take things out of context? Where do you learn how to properly live your life? If you become a believer and you stay in that same environment that you were in before, odds are you're going to fall back into that environment. Yeah. Believe in Christ or not. If I hadn't gotten out of the environment 
of the people that I was doing drugs with each and every single day, if I still had my drug dealer on the payroll helping me clean a van, I'd probably still be doing the drugs that I was doing. I had to rid myself of those people. And what's funny is, if you have a true conversion and you truly do get to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, most people will oftentimes rid themselves of you. I like to call it God's protection plan. Because they don't like you. You're shining a light on the things that they do in the dark, the things that they do in secret, the things that they don't want people to know about. We're going to go to a, a book that very few pastors talk about. It's called Revelation. It's in everybody's Bible. And uh, in Revelation 1, I, I, I think that this is an important piece of Scripture. It's a very small piece of Scripture. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. And it's just an introduction. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Such a small little verse packed with so much information. First thing we have to realize is John, one of the apostles, had suffered tribulations. He had suffered hardships. He was banished to an island. He didn't have the people that he loved around him. He was banished to an island because he was preaching the word of Christ. We're going to face tribulation. John is telling us, your partner in tribulation. He wouldn't have called himself a partner if we can't expect that in our lives. Now, tribulation is a different thing to every person. You know, there's people right now uh, in Egypt, their version of tribulation is a lot different because they're getting killed for their Christianity. We have a high school football coach that got fired because he can't say prayer on the 50-yard line. Both of them are tribulation. But which one outweighs the other one? We're, we're blessed. Our version of tribulation does not compare to some other parts of the country, but we should expect tribulation. We should be on the lookout for tribulation. And when we do face tribulation, that's where we have to stand strong and we have to stand firm. A lot of times when that tribulation comes, that's when the Christian, the, the strong Christian, or the Christian that's strong in their own mind, becomes weak and denounces Christ. When we face those problems, it, it's not just tribulation or it's not just people against us because we're Christians. It's all things in our life. All things in our life. I'll give you an example from my life. I, I injured myself. 17 years of rugby, it happens every now and then. I injured myself. The doctor gave me some pain pills, opiate pain pills. And I was like, you know what? I'm strong enough in my faith to do this properly. I can do this without a problem. And you know what happened? They all went up my nose. I was faced with that dilemma. I was faced with that temptation. And I thought that I was strong enough as opposed to praying and handing it over to the Lord and saying, Lord, what should I do? Now, when I did do that, I took that prescription back to the pharmacy and I said, don't fill this ever again. Tribulation comes when we drift away from the Lord, when we drift away from, from what he's told us to do. Now, the next part of that statement is patiently waiting. He's patiently waiting for the same thing we are, the second coming of Christ. It didn't happen. Well, we don't know. They never did tell when John died. He may be walking around with us right now. Could be. But, uh, you know, everyone since Christ's death has been waiting for the second coming of Christ. And, yeah, I just hear it more and more now. Oh, the time's coming. The time's coming. We're probably going to see it. We're probably going to see it. It may be a thousand years from now. But we need to patiently wait. We need to patiently live. We need to patiently do the things that he has told us to do. We can't just sit here expecting and not do work. Back of our shirts say doing work. We need to be doing work. 
And he says that he's a partner in the kingdom. The kingdom. If Jesus lives within you, you're a part of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the kingdom. The kingdom is within us. And John, the favorite disciple, according to the book of John, <laughs> is partnered with us. He's passing this knowledge along with us. He's, he's passing it on to us so that we can understand you're going to face this. You don't know when this is going to happen. And you need to be patient and do the things that you've been told to do. It's a pretty simple message in just that one little sentence. But oftentimes we read through that sentence so that we can get to the meaty and the juicy parts of Revelation. The parts that are a little bit harder to interpret. That message is just laid right out for us. Now, before I get into the next chapter, which we're going to go to chapter 3, but I want to just give some background, some education as far as reading Revelation. Because like I said, a lot of pastors are afraid of Revelation because they say that it's, it's so deep and uh, so hard to understand. It's actually not that hard to understand. And it's not spooky. It's not scary. It's, in actuality, if you think about it, it's the happiest book in the Bible. It is Jesus Christ's invitation to us to be conquerors of this world. Plain and simple. All the stuff that we read about after chapter 2 and 3, if we are believers, if we do truly live the life that Christ wants us to live, we don't have to worry about that stuff because we have conquered through Jesus Christ. Skip to chapter 21 and 22 and you get to see heaven and the new Jerusalem. Happiest book in the Bible. So I love teaching on Revelation. Now here's another thing that we need to keep in mind. Chapter 2 and 3 is the letters to the churches. Now, each of these churches are specific churches. And there's lots of different theories as to these churches. Oh, you can see some doozies. Just Google it. There's three that really make sense, though. The first one is that it's a message to all the churches throughout all time. The second is it's a message to specific churches that... We're going to face persecution and warning them ahead of time. And then the third theory is that that message was delivered to those churches because they made up a circuit. When you get home, look at a map and look at where these churches are located. Boop, 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 in a perfect circle. And actually, you can apply all three. All three are feasible. All three do not contradict each other. All three hold water. Now the other thing that we need to remember is when we read this, we need to take chapter 2 and 3 as a whole. Because the problems that they describe in chapters 2 and 3 are the problems that we're facing today as a church. And I'm not just saying today, I'm saying all time. All time, I mean, wow, you look back into the, to the, the third and fourth and fifth centuries, I mean, the, the Catholic Church, well, they, they ruled with an iron fist. And, uh, I mean, they were actually selling indulgences, you know. Uh, if your aunt died and she wasn't saved, but you wanted her to go to heaven, you just make a good donation to the church and you're going to heaven. So, I mean, we're not the first generation of the church that's had problems. We're not the first generation of the church that's messed up. We have to keep that in mind as well. Every generation is going to mess up because the church is comprised of human beings. We can't help but mess up. It's our nature. It's what we do when we mess up. It's how we rebound. It's whether or not we still cling to that faith. Last week I talked about the woman that just wanted to touch Jesus' garment. I don't want to just touch Jesus' garment. I want to grab a hold of it. And I want to hold on to it every single day because I know that if I let go, I am going to be messed up. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm not going to be able to live. I know that I'm not going to be able to make it. So even though I mess up, I'm still clinging to that garment with my right hand and then I'm going to grab it again with my left hand. But I'm holding on to it. 
So we have to keep that in mind before we read this next piece of scripture. It's chapter 3, starting with verse 14. I'd say that a lot of people in here are, are familiar with this. Uh, it's to the church of Laodicea. And, uh, and it reads, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works are neither hot nor cold. When that you were either hot or cold, so because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered. And I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And slave to anoint your eyes, so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. I behold... I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him. And he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verses 15 and 16. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. What does that mean in your mind? Have you ever heated up something in the microwave? Not put it in there long enough and taken a bite of it? Part of it's frozen, part of it's hot. Lukewarm, not good. You spit it out, you got to cook it for another little bit. He's talking about an indifference towards Christ. You're, you're neither here nor there. You might come and sit in a pew on Sundays and then go home and do whatever it is that you do anyway. That's not what we're commanded to do. We can't forget Jesus Christ when we walk out the door. We can't forget the love that he has for us. We can't forget what he's done for us. We can't forget the way that he wants us to live. We've talked about the different types of laws that there were in Israel. We've talked about the civil laws. We've talked about ceremonial laws. And then we talked about the laws that transcend time. And those are the laws that apply to every single society. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt love thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt... Pretty simple set of instructions, really. But it's hard for us sometimes because we're, we're, we, get, we get so much stuff put in front of us. And we know that we're going to mess up. And once again, cling to that garment. Hold on to it. Hold on to it tight. Don't get to be hot and cold. Stay hot. Even when you mess up, stay hot. Because you get down here to the next, the next verse. For I say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been refined by fire, so that you may be rich. And white garments, so that you may close yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. He is telling us, we're not everything that we think we are. We may have a big bank account on this earth. We may drive a nice car on this earth. We may have power or a, a great job on this earth. But that doesn't mean anything. He's offering what he has to you right there. I counsel you. He's counseling us. He's advising us to take part in the faith that he is giving us. Take part in the grace that he is giving us. That grace has withstood the world. That, 
That has already defeated the world. Jesus Christ defeated the world on the cross. He's already beat the world and he's offering it to us for nothing. As a matter of fact, he's advising us to take it because he knows that we are not smart enough to take it on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit advise us to take it. Because as people, we just can't do it. We can't do it. Well, you go down to the next one. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. This was a hard one for me to understand. But I got to thinking about it. As a youth pastor, I got to learn it really, really well. There's some parents that won't discipline their children. And there was a time or two as a youth pastor that I had to be harsh on these kids. I had to snap at them. Snap my fingers. If they heard the, hey, they knew what was up. <laughs> but those were the kids that loved us the most. Because they didn't get that at home. They knew that we cared. What he's asking us not to do is just the things that we shouldn't be doing. It's plain and simple. The things that he's asking us not to do are the things that are going to hurt us. You know, I, I think about it, you know, and I, I know I'm putting myself here, but I, I put myself in there because I don't want to call anyone else out. <laughs> but as a drug addict, I didn't understand the getting clean part. I didn't understand why I had to suffer, why I had to... To go through withdrawal, why I had to, why I had to want what I wanted, why I had to separate myself from my friends, why I had to do all these things in order to be in God's grace. But once I completed that, calling on the Lord and asking Him to help me, asking Him to hold my hand the entire way, I realized it was because He loved me. He put me through those hardships so that I knew that I was loved, and then. To top it off, he put me through those hardships so that I could help other people that are going through the same thing. God has a plan. And he's laying it out for us right here. And then the, the, the most beautiful part is right here at the end where he says that he's knocking at the door. And if we invite him in, what's he going to do? What do we always do? What do we, what, what do we always talk about? Breaking bread together. There's something special about breaking bread together. If you invite someone into your home and you break bread with them, that's love. He's inviting us to be a part of his kingdom. He's knocking and he's asking us to come. If you've ever noticed the picture, there, there's, a, there's an illustration of Jesus knocking on the door. The original one, and I don't know if the ones after have, but I, I believe the original one. The original one doesn't have a doorknob on Jesus' side. There's a reason for that. Because Jesus isn't going to open that door. That's on you. you got to open the door. He's knocking. If you don't open the door, you're not going to be a part of the kingdom. And this is where this sermon really gets bad. Because hell is real. Just like heaven's real. We get a real description of heaven at the end of Revelation. And we get a description of hell when he talks about the, the, the gnashing of teeth and the, and the burning and the anxiety. When, when they're in the... When he, he's talking about the rich man that dies and stepped over Lazarus and Lazarus is laying on Abraham and that man looks up and he says will you just put a drop of water on my tongue and Abraham says no you had your chance when you were on earth you didn't take it and he says well can you go back and can you tell my brothers about this no they've had their chance if they don't believe now why should I go and make them believe? This book, this book of Revelation is wonderful. If you truly believe in Jesus Christ and you're truly willing to hand over all of your problems. If you're truly willing to let him into every aspect of your life. 
If you don't compartmentalize your religion, I hate organized religion. <laughs> Whatever. No, the truth of the matter is, you're too big of a coward to hand your life over to Jesus Christ. You want to hold on to certain parts of it. You've got to give all or nothing. He doesn't want a part of you. He doesn't want a third. He doesn't want a half. He doesn't want three quarters. He wants every single bit of you. And if you're not willing to give that, that's on you. But you won't enjoy the kingdom. You may hope on his grace and mercy, and I don't know that I don't know. Maybe he will be merciful on you. But if I read the scripture correctly, which I'm pretty sure I did, he's not going to. He wants a full-time believer. He wants a full-time disciple. He wants people that are trained to do the work that he has put before us. And if we're not willing to do that work, we don't need to be here. We're wasting our time. I'm not trying to run anyone out of the church, but I'm, if you're not willing to do it, you're not doing anything but wasting time. You might as well be sitting at home. But you've got to make that decision. You got to make that decision. Because I know for a fact that you've had the gospel presented to you. I know for a fact that Jesus Christ has a plan for you. I know for a fact that God's sovereignty can overcome every single problem that you may face on this earth. These are all facts. So, what is it? Are you going to be a conqueror? Are you going to do and take part of the kingdom? Are you going to conquer this world like Jesus Christ did? Are you going to sit on his throne with him? He's inviting you to sit on the throne. Just like he did. He's inviting you to become royalty. He's inviting you to sit over the kingdom. Is it worth it? Is there anything in this world worth giving that up for? I guess that's the real question. I mean, there's some pretty cool stuff down here. But is it worth it? I guess that's where you got to do the two-column thing. Pros and cons. I know we've sat one out on my end. You know. And I just. I pray for each and every one of you. I pray for everyone that I run into. Because. As a Christian. And as someone who does believe. And as someone who tries. Every single day. To do what's right. And, and I fall and I stumble. I couldn't imagine my life any other way. I've lived it. I can look back on it. But I couldn't imagine it any other way. And now I also have an understanding that I had to live that way so that I could fulfill the plan that, that he had for me. And that's what I want each and every person here to do is to fulfill the plan that Christ has for you. Your plan is different than mine. Mm -hmm. But what we should do together <clears throat> is help make each other better disciples. Stay in the community like we have been. Do the things that Jesus Christ has asked us to do and live biblically. Simple set of rules. And if we do that, we don't have to worry about that day. We don't have to look for that day because if that day comes while we're still alive, it don't matter. We're going to paradise. If that day happens after our death, we're going to be on some horses behind them. <laughs> Giddy up. <laughs> so, you know, just, if I, if, if I, I always do a point before I ask, you know, before I pray, before we close out service. I guess the point that I want y'all to go home with today Go home and take an evaluation of your life. Go home and look at what you're giving God. Are you giving Him everything? Or are you relying on yourself for certain things and withholding certain things from God because you think you know better? It's a pretty simple thing to do. It's, it's hard, though, because when you do it, 
There's probably going to be some tears and maybe a little bit of pain, but it's going to be followed by joy and it's going to be followed by just an, an unexplainable tribulation and the fact that you finally know Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.